Hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you very, very much, Giles, for um, organising and agreeing to do this this evening. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. It's nice to see so many people here from so many different associations. I don't think we've joined as associations like this in the Northeast for uh, quite some time and indeed the Northwest. So hello and welcome everybody. Great. Um, thanks, Ian. So, so Ian asked me to do this and the idea was that I'd see you all in person and then, and then obviously COVID-19 happened and, and everyone's plans have changed. Um, and, uh, and so this is the, the first time I think uh, that I've tried to give this kind of talk to beekeepers. So um, I'll be really interested in your feedback at the end. Uh, maybe if, if you direct that back to, to Ian, that'd be fantastic. And I'd like to hear your thoughts. But, but Ian asked me to talk to you a little bit this evening about foul broods and um, and I used to work in the National Bee Unit for many years as the research coordinator about 15 years ago I started on bees I think it was um, and uh, and foul broods were always at the sort of the fore of all of the research that we did over that time and um, the talk itself is going to be broken into really three different three different areas we're going to start out with some slides we're going to then have a quiz um, all the time, all the way through, if you scroll around your, um, uh, your, your, uh, your bar, you should be able to find something that says chat. Okay. So if you go and click on the chat, probably in the participants area, you can ask any questions you like and, and uh, Zoom will record those questions and we can come back to them at the end and I'll go through the questions at the end. We can either have live questions or we can go through the ones from the chat bar as we go along. Um, I don't know that I can see them pop up because I've got a few different things going on at this end um, as it is. So we'll see. So that's my sort of chatting a little bit at the start it means that we're up to nearly 60 participants, which is good. Okay, right. So let's talk about foul broods. Um, the first thing to say is that a lot of the uh, photographs that I show in this presentation have come from the foul brood disease of honeybees, um, which is a, an advisory leaflet that's produced by the National Bee Unit. Um, when I was working in the bee unit, I haven't worked in the bee unit now for a number of years, um, but I would go around and travel to see researchers in lots of different parts of the world. And they'd always, as soon as I said I was in the National Bee Unit, they would say, oh yeah, fantastic advisory leaflets. We use those. So this would be beekeepers and research scientists in Australia, New Zealand, North America and parts of Europe would actually use some of the material that's produced from the bee unit. And I think it really is world-class teaching material. It's, it's a little tricky to, to find. Um, and if you navigate here on BeeBase, if you go to nation, uh, nationalbeeunit.com and you can find these advisory leaflets here, and there are lots of different PDFs that you can click on. And the one that we're going to be referring to a lot today is foul, foul brood disease of honeybees here. Okay. So um, that's a really useful reference and, and we'll come back to it as we, as we go through. We're going to split the talk into three different areas. We're going to talk a bit about identification of the current cases and, and recent histories, I guess. Um, then I'm going to share with you some of the research that we, that we did over the years where we were trying to track and trace infections and find out a little bit more about how these two rather sinister looking diseases, you can see them here, um, sort of uh, as criminals really uh, operate in in the UK and how they've been controlled in the UK. Um, I don't know if you'd look at this and think that AFB looks a bit more menacing because he looks a bit chunkier. Maybe maybe I think that too. And and those of you that are into your microscopy will will recognise what these are. These sort of endospores of of Penicillus larvae, the causative agent of American fowl brood. Okay. So, um, but actually EFB, and we'll talk about that later, is, is also a, a tricky disease, a tricky customer. Um, and finally, we're going to finish off by talking and really um, thinking about what you can do about it as beekeepers, what you can do about it as associations, um, because it's not really just up to the, to the bee unit inspectors to control this thing. It's actually down to the community that contains both the, the, the bee inspectors and the beekeepers and the associations to try to tackle these, these infections. So just as I get going, I'm going to pause, okay? And we're going to try and do a quiz. I don't know how this is gonna go, but we can give it a go, we see what happens. So it's a system called Polls, and I thought it would just be fun to um, ask you a few questions 
about foul brood. It's a bit of a warm up quiz. Okay, so you should see something on your screen. It should pop up. Hi folks, uh, unfortunately the recording, the live recording of the lecture to Newcastle beekeepers, it didn't actually share on screen any of the data or the questions that were being asked. So what I've done is I've taken the data from the live lecture and I've just gone over and turned it into some, some new, new figures. We can have a look at the data together uh, and I've sort of cut in this re-record, if you like. So what questions did we First two questions were about whether the attendees were confident of being able to spot American or European foul breeding in their other bee colonies. The options they had were not very confident. Well, maybe, maybe there's a chance. They're all very confident. And what you can see from these results is actually the results for American foul brood are in, in blue and European foul brood in orange uh, to the right. And you can see that the results are really quite similar. People felt equally as confident or not confident in, in being able to spot American or European fabry. That was a bit of a surprise to me at the time because I think American fabry is a little bit easier to spot. Sometimes EFB can be a little bit more tricky. But what really came out from these data is that the vast majority of people in the Northeast aren't confident. Um, it's worth me saying that of these eight very confident responses, this doesn't include the three bee inspectors that we had on the call. I took their data out, so these are actually beekeeper um, focused data. Not surprisingly, the three bee inspectors were very confident of being able to spot both, which is good, <laughs> a really good sign. The next question was, have you ever seen American or European fowl brood in a honeybee colony? as either no to both, yes to both, um, yes to one, or, or yes to the other. And of the 50 responses we had, the vast majority, 43, so 86%, had never seen European or American fowl brood in a colony. And some had seen both, and, and only one uh, had seen AFB and one had seen EFB. So the vast majority in the Northeast have not seen these diseases in, in a honeybee colony. And, and I think seeing them in the hive is, it's very similar with many aspects of beekeeping, where seeing these diseases in the flesh, it's very different from trying to learn out of a book. Much, much better if you can see uh, this disease in the colony when it comes to training. So it's worth thinking about this in the context of the fact that actually neither of these diseases are particularly prevalent in the north of England, but that doesn't mean they're not going to be prevalent in the future. So certainly something to keep an eye on, having so few people with the confidence to spot these diseases and with the experience of having seen them. The next question was a general knowledge question. The causative agents for American European fowl brood are bacteria, fungi, microsporidia, or viruses. And had we been playing who wants to be a millionaire, then and gone with ask the audience, then the audience would have been correct. So overall people were correct that, um, that actually both of these diseases are caused by bacteria. And it's important to know that because of some of the control methods that we use, use antibacterial agents uh, like oxytetracycline, and they wouldn't be effective against something like a fungus. Microsporidia, you can see here, lots of people thought it was microsporidia, 12 people thought it was microsporidia. Uh, these would be diseases like mesimosis caused by Nesema apis or Nesema serrani uh, or the newly characterised Nesema neumanniae, which has only been found in Africa so far. But actually, that's not what causes American and European fowl brood. And a few people thought viruses, and viruses can cause very serious diseases in honeybee colonies associated either with varroa in the form of deforming virus or with chronic bee paralysis virus uh, causing chronic bee paralysis. But actually, you know, European and American fabric are caused by bacteria, not viruses. The last question was, which foul brood disease predominantly affects larvae? And I gave uh, everybody the option of choosing AFB, EFB or both. The clue is really uh, in, in the question for this particular one. Both of these causative organisms would infect the larval stage, but actually the vast majority of the disease symptoms shown 
uh, within the larval stage uh, would be European foul brood. So most people didn't quite get this right. They thought both, maybe they were thinking of infection, uh, maybe they were thinking of infection, but actually EFB shows itself early in the, in the life cycle of the honeybee. So at the larval stage before capping, E, early EFB, and AFB tends to show itself after capping. So you get these sunken cappings, which I'll show you in these later slides. So yeah, American fowl brood after capping. So that summarizes some of the questions and the answers that people gave on the day, and we'll go back to the original recording of the lecture now. So let's have a look at identification and current cases. Hopefully you can all see um, uh, the presentation again and the polls disappeared, fingers crossed. Um, Okay, so American fowl brood, let's talk about American fowl brood. So it's a bacterial brood disease. It's no, statutorily notifiable in the UK. It's not in every country in the world. Um, and um, that means that the government are responsible for the control, but it also means that if you suspect that you have this disease as a beekeeper, you're, you're legally obliged to get in touch with the MBU and tell them that you think you may have a problem. The MBU spends something like 18 to 20 percent of their inspection resource responding to requests from beekeepers. Is someone having a bit of a scribble? <laughs> um, was that me? I don't think it was. Um, <laughs> yes, you can. You can draw on the screen, guys. Um, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll just see what I can do to stop that. I don't know that I can. Um, yeah, if in annotation you can draw on the screen, and I'm not sure just how to get rid of it at the moment. So um, if I annotate and I clear all the drawings, there we go. So if we can try not to, not to scribble on the screen, that'd be good guys. There'd be lots of buttons you can click on to interact with me in, uh, in amusing ways. Um, and uh, uh, best if we, if we try not to and stick to the chat if we can. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so government's responsible for control. It's caused by Pini bacillus larvae. You can see um, one of the spores of Pini bacillus larvae here. The spores are really important when it comes to the biology because it's got this really, really thick cell wall here and it makes it incredibly resilient in the environment. And actually, uh, this particular organism can survive for sort of 30 plus years in the absence of a host, in the absence of a honeybee. And if you bring it together with a honeybee, it will be able to cause disease. So it's a phenomenally resilient organism. Um, many of these Pinibacillus species are because they tend to live in the soil and such like. Okay, so how does it work? It's in the food, it gets fed to the larva um, and it infects when the larva is very young. But actually the disease doesn't really show itself until post capping, okay, during the pupil form, which is kind of part of the question I asked you earlier. And the easiest way to remember that AFB happens later is that A is after, after capping. AFB after capping. Okay, um, that means that if you want to try to see um, symptoms, you might start out looking at this sunken capping here, and you might have to pick back the sunken capping to see this sort of melted down, gooey bacterial mess that that was the pupa. Okay, the early stage pupa or pre pupa. Okay, now if you wanted to conduct one of the oldest tests in in honeybee pathology. You could do it with nothing more than a stick. Okay, you poke a stick in there, you give it a good swirl around, give it a good stir up, and then you draw it out. And if you get a string coming out, so it's called a rope test, uh, and think about some nice cheese on a pizza, drawing out from a pizza as you pull the pizza up to your mouth, and that, imagine that bit that gets stuck on your chin or in your beard. Um, that's, that's just like you might get with a rope test. There are very few um, bacterial diseases of honeybees that, that actually create that kind of film, that, that, that sort of um, stretchy rope. So this is a really, really good diagnostic test that's been around for a long time. Okay, so this particular, we'll look at some more symptoms as we zoom out a little bit on the frames in a second, but American fabric, it's also important to say, is not just found in America. It was first described by the Americans from the point of view that it was distinguished between to distinguish between American fowl brood, which was sort of characterized well in America, um, and European fowl brood, which was characterized well in the UK. Okay, so let's have a look on this next. Okay, so these are all images from the leaflet that I, that I pointed, to you, uh, pointed to you earlier. 
Um, let's zoom out a little bit. We were looking at one particular sunken capping. So perhaps we were looking underneath this sunken capping here. Hopefully there's lots of things would ring alarm bells when you look at this picture and you compare this picture top left to the picture top right, which is some nice, healthy honeybee brood. We've got here, it's nice and solid. Um, I was looking at a few frames that look like this up Newcastle way today uh, and it looked great. This is what we call pepper pot brood pattern. So what's happened is that some, um, some of these developing brood have died, they've been removed, and then it's been laid up so that everything gets out of synch synchronization. Now, sometimes this can actually happen in, an, in a colony that doesn't have foul brood. So it's not diagnostic on its own. So this sometimes happens when there's a nectar flow on and, and, the, and, and the, the, the queen's laying area gets congested with nectar just for a few days and that stops her laying. She lays, lays into the ones that are free and have been polished. And then you can sometimes end up with a slightly pepper potty brood pattern. Um, but you wouldn't get it with these sunken cappings. These are really quite characteristic. They're greasy looking, they're darker. Some of them have been chewed back. Okay, so we don't like the look of that. Um, this is a bit of a zoom in there, you can see. So the other thing that you can get as well is that when, when the bees try and clear out these cells where, where the, the, the developing brood have died, they sometimes leave a little bit here, uh, stuck to the side, and this is a scale. Um, this was actually used in a, in a, in a health leaflet, um, a healthy bees plan leaflet. And the people that were using pictures just off, off B-Base, there's a really good stock of pictures in the gallery on B-Base, um, uh, didn't notice that this was actually uh, a cell. It's very easy, easy to miss these, these uh, scales here. Um, they line up on the upper surface and you can catch them if you look up into the light. Okay. This here is a, is a, a rarer site and this is a very late stage pupa which has, um, which has died. And you can actually still see the tongue here. But we, we're starting to look then at, at, um, at, at sort of colony level symptoms. I won't talk to you much about the smell because not everybody gets the smell and not every, every case in the field has the smell. So I don't tend to talk about that. Some books say, oh, you know, you can tell just by smelling. Um, and, and actually some bee inspectors do say you can, um, but it doesn't happen all the time. Um, so I don't tend to talk about that as, a, as an important diagnostic marker. Okay. So let's have a, a think about how American fowl brood is transmitted. Um, it's an ancient disease. It's been associated with honeybees for many, many tens, hundreds of thousands of years to have evolved alongside it. And as a result, it interacts beautifully as many parasites do with its host. Okay. Um, uh, it, it takes advantage of the different uh, behaviors of the host. So if you think about when honeybee colonies naturally try and split, um, they go and they suck up lots of honey. Well, honey is one of the roots of transmission. Okay, they suck up lots of honey and they go and they make a new nest somewhere. Well, it's been proven that they can take American fowl breed with them, um, Penobicillus larvae, a causative agent with them, and then subsequently suffer from the disease. Because it's found in honey and it's incredibly stable in honey, people think that honey is free of bacteria. It isn't. And there are plenty of bacteria in honey and that's what makes it in, in, an interesting uh, uh, thing to eat, um, but but those bacteria can't can't reproduce in the honey. Okay, they can't they can't reproduce because of the very high sugar content. So, um, but as that honey gets digested by the bees, then it can start to grow again. Okay, so robbing obviously is a is a way of of moving of the bees moving. American fowl brood and drifting as well. So if you've got lots of colonies lined up, I suppose you could say this is a beekeeper problem looking at this particular apiary. They're all lined up looking beautifully neat. Um, and all the entrances facing the same way, they all look the same. And as a result, you get an awful lot of bees coming out of this one and then going off and coming back and going in this one. Okay, because bees actually aren't that good at going into the right colony. Um, we did some work a few years ago where we looked at the genetics of, of honeybees in, in one colony and 66% of the bees hadn't been born there that ended up in that colony that drifted in from the colonies nearby. So you can have a large proportion of the bees in a colony that, that, weren't, that weren't there. You often hear beekeepers talk about, we, we always say, oh, it's the, my best colony is the one on the end. Yeah, it's always the one on the end, isn't it? And it depends which way the bees have been foraging and, and the end one might be the one that they come back to first or it might be the one they get blown down to with the wind. Um, but if you, if, you, if you looked at the microsatellite markers and you genotype them, you might find that many of the ones in your best colony weren't actually from your best colony. 
Okay, so lots of ways that American fabric can move um, naturally, and lots of ways that we can move it as beekeepers. So lots of studies over time have all pointed to ways that we can move it. We can move it on equipment, we can move it when we're managing bees, you know, when we're balancing colonies off and moving things between colonies, and we can move it when we work between apiaries, okay, and that's really where it starts to kick in as a problem in an area when people move it from apiary to apiary, okay. Now sometimes we do move equipment between apiaries, um, but if we're just being beekeeping we should think about the biosecurity, we should think about what we can do to prevent the disease moving from, from one apiary to another. And then the other way that humans exacerbate problems with, with transmission is honey, isn't it? I mean, we have a huge global trade in honey and uh, we've looked in, in, if you look in the literature, you'll find lots of really good studies that look at honey that's being imported into places like um, um, uh, Australia or, or commercial honeys that are moving around in Australia. And, and a large proportion of them can be positive for American and European fowl brood. Um, causative agents okay. obviously the honey doesn't have the disease it has the causative agent uh, and that will be transmissible too okay so I always think it's better to try to put these sorts of facts into a case study and the case study I have for you is a very modern one from uh, from 1790 um, and this particular case study uh, was written by a guy called Ab Abbey Della Rocca who was a Levantine priest born in Istanbul and he lived in the Aegean for a number of years uh, as the priest out there. And um, it's a really nice case study. It doesn't talk about American fowl breed because American fowl breed hadn't been named then, but he does talk about a malaise, which is another way of talking about a disease. And I think that the symptoms are pretty um, characteristic of American fowl brood. Okay, so we're talking about an island in the Aegean Sea. It looks picturesque, you can see it here in this picture here. Um, and this happened in the 1780s. And what happened was that the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the bees out in the countryside suddenly um, died, okay? And the, and the beekeepers didn't really know what had happened, um, but they died. And because honeybee colonies are very valuable, but they're not just valuable when they're alive, they're valuable when they're dead for the wax and the, for the honey, um, then um, they brought them back in to melt out the wax and melt out the honey. Um, in the towns, okay? And there's a lovely extract I wanted to share with you. And here it is here. So the remains of the hives that were lost were taken to the streets of the town to expose them to the sun in order to extract all the wax. And the bees from the neighborhood sucked up the honey, caught the disease and communicated it to other hives and all without exception perished in a short time. Now for me, really, um, unless there's some really pretty serious toxins in that honey, um, that sounds very much like American fowl brood to me. Okay, so it's a nice case study, I think, of American fowl brood. I'm just going to have a little little look up at more. There's a chat. There's three chats. Um, yeah, I can come back to these a little bit later. Some of them are related to what I've been talking about, and some of them are related to what I'm about to talk about. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, on to the next slide. This starts to, to answer some of the questions actually. So if we look at American fabric, we, we've got American fabric really to thank for having an inspection service at all in this country. Um, without it, the MBU wouldn't have been called for. It came in as a result of um, the, the war, uh, Second World War, uh, over-reliance on, on imported sugar and a problem in the honeybee uh, to, produce, to produce honey in this country because the honeybee colonies kept dying of fowl brood. Okay, so uh, you can see what happened as the inspection effort ramped up, the, 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 the percentage of diseased colonies came down over time. And we can see it's kept pretty low and then it dips even lower around 2000, it gets a bit lower. Of course, this is because I started working in the bee unit about here. No, it's not really. Um, it, it's, it's because actually we had all sorts of tools available to us to help us to manage um, American fowl brood spatially and temporally, which we didn't have before. Um, What's interesting about American fabric is the way that it's been controlled. It's been controlled by burning all the way through. So all the internal hive parts are burnt, the, the boxes are scorched, and effectively um, the, 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 the colony is destroyed. Nothing is, nothing is kept, but the major pieces of equipment can be, can be scorched and, and, and reused. And that hasn't changed. And it's a very, very effective, you can see how effective that is as a, as a treatment. So I've got a couple of maps for you now that I did today. Um, not as pretty as I'd like them, but they, they kind of uh, 
they, they, they show a point, I think. So if we look back from 1994 all the way up to 2019, we can put dots on a map as to where the cases of, of American fowl brood have been found over time. And if we look at that, just look at that picture here, it looks a bit like someone's fired a shotgun at um, England and Wales, okay? Uh, data that, that, that I um, have access to um, uh, stop at the border. There obviously are data up here in Scotland, and I'll talk a bit about that when we talk about European fowl breed later. Um, but there are a few clusters maybe forming to the eye, but overall it looks like it's, it's been shot with a shotgun, lots of lots of holes. If we start looking at cases each year, just have a look at this map. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, in one year, doesn't matter which year, focus on an outbreak cluster. OK, and watch to see if that outbreak cluster re is retained the following year or if it disappears and another one pops up in a different place. OK. I'll let you watch that as it rolls through all the different years. And what you're probably spotting is actually these things move, these, these clusters move, and it's because um, the inspection service is coming in, it's discovering an outbreak, sometimes a big outbreak, sometimes a small one. And it's controlling it very rapidly because AFB responds very, very well to the treatments that we have. Okay. Um, we did some work um, a few years ago where we looked at data. It's a slightly different timeline of data we looked at with Aileen Mill at Newcastle. It's before I worked at Newcastle, but I, I was working with Newcastle before I got a job up there. And this was really starting to take the, the, the data that we saw in that map that was on the left and try, just to see if we could actually say anything about um, clusters forming in the landscape. It's a really important aspect of epidemiology because what, we, what we're asking there is we're asking if clusters um, are, are more close together than we would expect by chance, then we're saying that we've got local spread, we've got local transmission that's forming that cluster. So statistically, it's, not, it, it's an important observation when we're thinking about the epidemiology of a disease. And what all these circles represent are significant clusters, but just over a short period. And if I was to click on one of them, you would see it, 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 it would tick along from 1994. Then there'd be a blip where the, the outbreak occurred, and then it would drop off very rapidly and disappear, which kind of uh, is shown in that, in that sequence, in that GIF that I, that I showed you on the previous slide. So treatment for American fabric seems to be working pretty well. What about EFB? Let's have a look. EFB. So again, we're dealing with a statutory notifiable disease. There aren't so many countries in the world that, that treat this as a notifiable disease, although more of them are thinking of doing it actually in the future, um, particularly in Europe. Uh, it affects four to five day old honeybee larvae. Uh, you, I'll show you a sequence of how, of how perhaps a larva might progress. Um, and effectively, it takes over the whole of the honeybee gut. You can see in this picture here um, from um, a paper by Takamatsu uh, in Japan, where he's sort of stained up the melissococcus in the gut. And you can see this is a slice through a larva. And you can just see how many, um, how many um, propagules you end up with in, a, in an individual infected larva. And it's thought that actually the, the, the pathogen starts to starve the larva rather than killing the larva with lots of fancy toxins like um, AFB does to pupae. So it's caused by a different bacterium called Melissococcus plutonius. Um, it's a non-spore former, but don't let, that, don't let that fool you. Just because it's a non-spore former doesn't mean that it can't survive in the environment. It can survive in the environment and we showed a number of years ago that, that Melissococcus plutonius is viable in honey which is over one year old. And that has relevance when you're thinking of how to manage it, because that would mean then that things like honey supers could well represent a legitimate source of, of, of reinfection. OK, again, don't be fooled by European. It has a global distribution. So let's have a look at our healthy larva. It's, it's, it's ingested earlier in its life. It ingested some lysococcus. It's starting to grow in its gut like we have over here, but it's not showing any symptoms yet. Um, but it's just hitting the age where it might. And it starts to twist. So the first thing you notice is instead of being a nice C, it starts to twist in the cell. Okay, you don't get any melting down initially, twist in the cell. You might get a slight discoloration and then you'll get a loss of segmentation. So as that larva dies, it putrefies, effectively turns into a puddle in the bottom of the cell. 
Um, and then that puddle slowly dries. If you've got advanced European foul brood symptoms that have been there for a while, those, those um, um, puddles can dry a little bit and form these slightly rubbery, so not stringy, um, uh, scales. And those scales can dry, and you might think that might be a, an, an, an AFB scale at that point, but AFB scales line up, um, and, and EFB scales tend to be very higgledy-piggledy, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, we go back to the foul brood leaflet um, produced by the, the bee unit. We're going to look on the right-hand side of these lovely C-shaped larvae. Um, nice and plump. Look, they look juicy. If I was a wasp, I'd eat one of those. That looks lovely. Um, and then over here, uh, oh dear. Okay, so for a start, the first thing I notice when I look at this, I try not to look at individual cells. I just look at the pattern. And the pattern here is that you go from capped to eggs in the same patch of brood okay so straight away you're thinking now why why has that happened and and and, and you maybe look a bit closer and you start to see twisting can you see these aren't laying flat they're not laying as a c okay and then you might start to notice that some of them are starting to melt down okay and you can see here some that have melted down and started to form scales okay so um, again some people get the smell some people don't some outbreaks have the smell and some outbreaks don't um, not sure why. Okay, so that in introduces you to European fowl brood. This is a really easy slide. It's a bit of a cheeky slide because really European fowl brood can move around in exactly the same way as American fowl brood. It can do everything that American fowl brood can do. Okay. When it comes to how we've controlled it over time, perhaps it's less of a success story because it's a trickier customer to deal with European fowl brood. Um, and uh, what we've got over time, these arrows represent changes in the way that the foul brood has been managed. Okay, so early on, all, all symptomatic colonies were destroyed, and then we had a brilliant new invention called oxytetracycline. So we're, we're starting to, to use sort of teramycin, we're starting to use antibiotics. Okay, so ATC is not, um, it doesn't kill the bacteria. What it does is it prevents the bacteria from replicating. That's how it works. It's called a bacteria static. Okay. Um, and initially, every colony on an apiary that had EFB would have been treated with OTC. Okay. And then that practice changed here in the early 80s. And we started to only treat symptomatic colonies. And then we start to see this ramp up. Okay. And that's not surprising because we now know that a lot of colonies can be that are symptomless can be carrying quite a lot of meniscococcus. And if you like, it's a ticking clock that takes a, a long time to show itself, maybe, maybe one or two years to start to show itself. Whereas American fowl brood, it gets in there, it shows itself very rapidly, it gets controlled. European fowl broods are a little bit smarter than that. It doesn't show its hand very quickly, very rapidly. And then you can see that we really have seen a steady decline over the last 20 years. And if this carried on to today, you'd see it continue to decline. We have the odd peak in a year where large outbreaks are discovered, but it tends to be that this mix of mixture of OTC, Shook's form and destruction seems to be working, but we haven't done everything equally over time in recent years. We're still learning things about how best to, to control um, European fowl brood. Um, and I wanted to, again, share something with you uh, from old, from, from, from back in the day. Not my day. I don't know if anybody's on the call that, that, that was around in 1980. Not too many. I don't know um, how many people were. Um, but this is a lovely quote, and it's from a Farmer's Bulletin from the United States Department of Agriculture um, uh, by Phillips in 1918. And I'll just read it to you just in case you can't. I don't know how big your screens are, so I'm going to read these quotes so that everyone gets to hear what they say. And it says European fowl brood has caused much trouble in treatment and, and causes, I'm not going to do an American accent, and causes more anxiety among beekeepers than does American fowl brood. It's recognised generally that European fowl brood requires less drastic me methods than does American fowl brood, but seemingly one cannot always be so sure of the efficacy of the treatment. And it's often said by beekeepers that European fowl brood does not fight fair. I love that concept that you have a disease that doesn't fight fair because actually of the two diseases and you saw from the previous sort of prevalence data that we had um, in, in England and Wales of the two diseases, European fowl brood is the trickier one to control. And I think if, as a beekeeper, I think I'd rather have AFB than EFB without a doubt. Okay. So how have these treatments changed over time? How have we been learning more recently about which treatments might be the best? 
you can see just a very simple um, bar here of, of Schuch's form, uh, which is this treatment in the middle here. This is a treatment whereby you move the bees into this box. It's a clean box, it's been scorched, it's got nice new frames to be drawn. You put the bees and the queen in here and then you feed it like crazy and let it draw out those frames. Um, and then you burn all these interior parts and you scorch the boxes, okay? Uh, and that's represented by this green bar here, okay? But back in time, 1994, this wasn't really being used. We were choosing between the red, which is oxytetracycline here, okay? And down, um, down on the bottom in the blue, destruction, which is the same treatment as, as with American fowl brood. And you're sort of ticking along and there's a slight tendency through the 1990s to to say that OTC is the bringer of all things good. Okay. So the first experiment I was involved in in the bee unit, so it's before I actually worked there, but I was sort of um, contracted over to help them with the, some experiments, was one to try to look at um, um, the efficacy of this, of this treatment versus this treatment, the oxytetracycline versus the Shook Swarm. And you can see that we started doing it here, like in 2004, five and six were the years that we did these experiments. And what we found um, when we, um, we randomly gave a colony one or the other treatment, and then we went back within a year just to see what, what the reoccurrence was. And what we found was the reoccurrence in the oxytetracycline treated colonies was 22%, which is really rubbish. You know, if you're going to treat something, you don't want one in five to show symptoms within a year. You really don't. Um, but with, with Shook Swarm, it was much better. It was one in 20 that was showing symptoms within a year. So straight away we think, oh, okay, well, maybe this is better. Um, I kind of sometimes make a bit of a joke. It's not a joke to, to lose your bees to either of these two diseases. They're both severe and burning them is no fun. But obviously, if you burn your colony, you don't get any reoccurrence at all. You know, it doesn't reoccur in that colony. So uh, we could say that that's a zero, okay? And, and, and when we look at the data, and we've more recently looked at the data, before I left the bee unit, actually, um, it's quite clear actually that, 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 that destruction does seem to be the best option for long-term treatment, okay? And so with that changing um, uh, enactment of policy and that new information and evidence from the field, you get to see this really nice picture with how our treatment practices change from doing the experiments around here to more people adopting Shook Swarm, the green bar gets bigger, fewer, fewer, um, people um, or even bee inspectors opting to use the OTC okay and this bar gets very small as we go to the previous two years very few cases were treated with OTC often used as a holding treatment now because sometimes Shook Swarm is too late in the season to use it so you, you hold it with OTC and then you treat it with Shook Swarm in the spring that's how it's often deployed now and you can see destruction became a bit more common as well with that knowledge that it was a very useful treatment so we're still getting to grips with it I think you can see over the last 20 years, we've got much, much better at managing European fowl brood, but it's still a, a tricky customer. Let's have a look where it pops up. Well, very different distribution. You know, instead of um, being a shotgun approach, we've got many more cases. We've got 16 and a half thousand cases between 94 and, and, and 2019 on this particular map. Okay. And you can see that large parts of the country just get greened out, don't they? Particularly in the South. And that greening dissipates as you go North until you get up where some of you guys are phoning in from and you're thinking, ah, this isn't a disease that affects our area, is it? You know, it's not something that we have to worry about, okay? Um, I, I disagree with that. It's something that you really should worry about because you don't want to end up like this in 10 years time, <laughs> okay? Um, let's have a look over time and see if we can spot any patterns over time as we go through time. And hopefully you'll be able to see that as you pick a cluster and look at it, you, you realize actually it's quite often still there the year after. Okay, it tends to be bubbling away in an area for a long time EFB. It's very difficult to manage. It's very difficult to eradicate from an area. That doesn't mean that there haven't been successes. There have been successes, but it's a much more insidious and, and, and slow burning and difficult to deal with disease. Okay. Let's have a look. Uh, let's see if I can move on. So, um, 
one of one of the beekeepers contacted me i think it was yesterday and asked the question so i put a slide in to answer the question and they said oh you know why don't we get much fowl brood in the north of england and and in particular european fowl brood you do get a bit of american fowl brood um we saw that on the previous map but you don't often get european fowl brood and this is an extract from one of uh, one of our papers from a few years ago now but effectively this absence of disease in the north of england sort of presents two equally compelling hypotheses when you're a scientist and one of them could be that actually melissococcus plutonius the causative agent is simply absent from the north of england okay um the second would be that actually melissococcus plutonius is, is ubiquitous and you can find it in every honeybee uh, apiary across the country and it's just that in some parts the environmental conditions are conducive for the disease to show itself so there are two different ways of looking at it what we suggested in this particular paper we tested 18 apiaries from the north of england and, and north wales at the time which was free of disease and none of them tested positive for melissococcus plutonius that's lending itself to this concept that actually the reason you guys don't have it so much in the north is because you don't have melissococcus plutonius there's no problem with the fb causing disease up in your area it's just that it's not there at the moment and um i've got some slightly better evidence for that we did a apiary survey of 4600 apiaries a few years ago 29 2009 to 2011 and what i've done on this particular map again i only did it today so it's a little bit shonky but um all the grey dots show apiaries that were sampled, okay, and the green dots show those apiaries which, which tested positive. So that when they are tested at random, these are randomly chosen apiaries um, for, for EFB, for, for Melissococcus plutonius. So what you can see again is that the north of England here doesn't really have any even you know, background levels of Melissococcus that we would have detected with this very sensitive test. It's also interesting to note the apiary density. So in this particular survey, around 10% of all apiaries across England and Wales were sampled at random. Okay, so that means that when you see fewer dots up here, it's because there are fewer apiaries up here. Okay, and I think that that perhaps is key to the disease not coming up too much to the north of England. And it's to do with the, 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 the density of the apiary network up here, and it hasn't had the opportunity to get here yet. We know that there's been large outbreaks of, of EFB and AFB as well up in Scotland in the last 10 years. So that myth of you can't get it in the north has kind of been knocked on the head because there's been some pretty spectacular outbreaks north of the border. Okay, so, so that would be my cut on it. That would be my answer to that particular question from one of your number. So I wanted to share a little bit of uh, information on tracking and tracing, talking about EFB first. And I wanted you to start thinking about the genetics of these diseases, okay? And thinking about how we tell the difference between one outbreak and another outbreak and whether they're related. And to do that, you've got to understand the concept of something called multi-locus sequence typing, okay? Now, um, we'll break it down and we'll keep it, we'll keep it in, in lay speak, okay? But basically, every organism obviously has a genetic code. It has its heritable genetic material where you pass information on from you to your children. Bacteria are exactly the same. This is um, a bacterial genome. It's circular. And in here, there are around 2,000 genes. So 2,000 individual pieces of genetic code that form building blocks to create cells, okay? And what we did with two different PhD students, Ed Haynes and Barbara Morrissey, is we created a scheme that helped us to really focus in on the genes within here, these 2000 genes. We picked out for EFB, um, we, we picked out four, and for AFB, we picked out seven genes, okay? And these genes were the genes which were most variable from between one strain and another. And uh, I'm gonna skip through this. So I'm not going to go through and describe these, but effectively what we're doing is we're trying to build a profile a bit like a fingerprint uh, between one bacterial strain and another bacterial strain using these regions which are very variable between one bacterium and another. And it's just like fingerprinting in humans. It's that same sort of, um, same sort of output. It's a slightly different technology, but the, the outcome is exactly the same. Okay. And you can start to build these family trees, you see. So it's just like, who do you think you are for bacteria? But effectively, what you're able to do is you're able to start thinking about um, which, which, which outbreaks are related to which other outbreaks. You know, rather than looking at all those green dots for EFB, maybe if we had 
a, a, a scheme like this, we would actually start to see patterns uh, in the outbreaks. So what these data show us when we start mapping the diversity across of Melissococcus plutonius across England and Wales is really interesting. This here is a, a map from a paper that we published a few years ago in 2014. And all these different shapes and colors represent genetically similar types using our multi local sequence typing regime that I just described. And you can see that in some cases, you have clusters forming in the landscape of genetically similar Melissococcus plutonius. And when we look at data that, that's continued to be collected, we now know that there are 28 sequence types that have been found in the UK, and they belong to three different bacterial families. They're all Melissococcus plutonius, they're all the same species, but they form families within there, these things we call clonal complexes. What's great about doing this over time is that we've realized that there are 11 sequence types which were once found here in England and Wales, but through the actions of the National Bee Unit, through the control enacted by the um, MBU and also the beekeepers themselves, 11 of those sequence types have been eradicated. Um, and there may well be more local eradication events as well of particular types from particular areas. So this information is really useful for us when we start looking at trying to control and monitor the, the efficacy of control methods in England and Wales. What about AFB? Well, AFB is similar. Um, same sorts of protocols have been developed with AFB, except that it's a seven gene scheme. I don't have a map. The map is less interesting to show you. Instead, I'm showing you these uh, related bacterial families. There are four of them for Pina bacillus larvae, the causative agent of American fowl brood. We know 15 of these have been found in the UK. Uh, we do see some local clustering, um, but the clusters tend to be a little bit smaller because the disease is that much rarer. And we have these two families. We have these blue ones, and we also have two of these three green ones as well. And using the same repeated monitoring over many years, we realized that actually there are four sequence types that we believe have been eradicated for Pena bacillus larvae. Okay, so really useful information. It's giving us that extra layer of information when it comes to thinking about transmission events and thinking about controlling these foul brood diseases. So this is the last part then, just to finish off, what can you do about it? What can you do about it as, a, as individuals? Well, as individuals, you can practice good biosecurity. We talked about this, good biosecurity, um, for me, would be thinking about, if you, particularly if you're moving between sites, some people do it between colonies, but sometimes that can be very difficult on one apiary site. I always think of one apiary site as one infective unit. Effectively, it's one, um, one huge disease propagule. So I always think about biosecurity, certainly, between apiary sites to so don't don't move things between apiary sites if you can help it uh, think about cleaning your gloves and your hive tool and even having different smokers between hive site uh, between apiary sites they're all useful ways of considering biosecurity um housing swarms in boxes with undrawn frames that's something which is one of my bugbears in a way i suppose uh, when you think about how shook swarm works and shook swarm was invented to control american fowl brood and we use it to control european fowl brood um, uh, you're putting the bees in a box and you, 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 you're taking away their ability to produce young very quickly and that, that takes a lot of the bacteria out of the system. Okay, If you put drawn frames in a swarm box and you let them get going very quickly, whoopity doo da, the disease gets in there very, very quickly. Okay, So undrawn frames and feed is a much safer way of collecting swarms. Uh, obviously don't buy secondhand frames, um, I'd never do that. Uh, these are more things I, I, I do, and I, having worked on fowl breed for, for a while. Um, you, you're, all, you're all doing this next point, which is to familiarise yourself with the diseases. This is the first step. The second step is to download the, the uh, I almost called it a brochure, a fowl breed brochure. It's not actually a brochure, is it? You know, um, but the fowl breed advisory leaflet. And uh, um, download that. Um, get yourself familiar. The bee inspector is always willing to come and, and talk to you about, and they've got lots more pictures and lots more experiences with fowl brood. And if you get any doubt at all, call your bee inspector. Um, the last point I wanted to make was think about 
think about working as a community think about working as sort of neighborhood watch you know this this isn't a, a policeman in our case it might be a bee inspector and these are all beekeepers of different ages um and and if you work as a community then you're much more likely to keep it out and and to keep on top of the outbreaks that you might get um because anyone getting foul brood it's just luck you know it is luck some of the time there's some fantastic beekeepers out there really brilliant beekeepers that ended up with foul brood and it's just one of those things but it's about how you react to getting it so for me i don't think there should be any secrecy or shame in getting foul brood you should share that with your neighbors you know you should talk to them about it maybe even the best beekeepers i've seen over the years that have managed foul brood in their area have basically gone to their local association and said look guys i've got foul brood do you want to come and see it and then in a controlled way show people what it looks like that's the best way to tackle it anyone can get it it's about what you do after you get it which defines you i think as a, as a beekeeper you squirrel everything away and you don't tell people and you try and manage it yourself you know that 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 should be in the bad beekeeper's guide you know um so just to summarize then uh, foul broods are well worth avoiding controls improved over the years particularly with efb we're getting on top of it a bit better now than we used to um lots of infections are highly localized but we are able to eradicate in this country with the methods that we have and the tools that we have but it's all about early recognition and biosecurity both really really important aspects okay thanks to lots of different people particularly uh, victoria here uh, victoria Tonkins, who collected a lot of these data um for the sts and then ed haynes and barbara morrissey who helped to develop those uh, methods as part of their phds um the person who got me involved in all of this right at the start was mike brown without him i'd never worked on bees at all so um thanks to him and the bee inspectors and the bee unit for all they've done uh, with me over the years and continue to do i still work with the bee unit very closely um and beekeepers a lot of the experiments i talk about require the inter interaction of beekeepers bee farmers without that we wouldn't have any of these sorts of uh, a lot of these really useful data sets um thanks to funders lots of deep people have funded us over the years particular thanks to bernard diaper at bee, bee disease insurance does a fantastic job of supporting these young scientists and, and supporting these phd students um supported both ed and barbara in theirs okay so thank you for your attention and let's move on to the questions if we can find the questions let's have a look more chat right here we go um ah okay so the first question from ian is historic patterns or hotspots seem to have a significant influence over afb and efb distribution is is that correct well certainly it does for efb i think i showed quite clearly it does for efb uh, less so for afb because they tend to be quite successfully um uh, controlled within a few years um uh, so we've got a question um i had afb four years ago brought into my apiary by a swarm taking up residence in an empty hive is this a common way of transmission i think i covered that too didn't i this is good i've covered the first two two questions um uh, I'm just going to stop sharing that. Um, and yes, it is. Uh, it can move. It's it's well well documented in the literature that both AFB and EFB can move in swarms. Uh, and the best way, if you are a swarm collector or do that as part of your beekeeping practice, is to give them a really rubbish start <laughs> and try and stretch that start out over as long as you can. Um, oh yeah, how did the common names come about? Um, why American and European? I think I covered that one too. I think um, so. American was named by the Americans because it was first well categorized in America and separated out from European. European was called European because back in the 1880s, I think it was, um, uh, a couple of uh, gentlemen beekeepers first described European foul brood symptoms. So when they started to see that in the States, they referred this would have been in the early, early 1900s um around 1906 um they actually went back to the previous paper and said that it was european foul brood and separated them out by name because up until that point they'd just been foul brood okay um track and trace requires information about beekeepers location do you think compulsory registration would help tracing this is a really interesting question um uh, from john um so lots of different countries have tried lots of different things and this is i'm answering with my hat on from having been in the bee unit for a while and and the best example i can give you is uh, new zealand so new zealand had 
they brought in compulsory registration and compulsory registration actually led only to something like 90 percent of beekeepers being registered even though they had very harsh penalties if you didn't register um the people rebel against being told that they have to go on a register not everybody but a significant proportion of people don't like to be um in the system and on a map they like to be off the map and they're happy to do that if 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 it's uh, kept as a more of an informal please you know it's a smart thing to do um but less so if they're told they have to do it okay so that's why um but you're right tracking and tracing is only and we've seen this with covid haven't we it's only as good as knowing where everybody is all the time um and uh, and, and that can be a challenge it's also a challenge that 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 you know wild bees um wild bee colonies they're not on anyone's any bee, bee inspector's map as well and they've been shown previously to to house um, american and european fowl brood as well so uh, it's not perfect but it's not bad and i think the figures kind of show that we're, we're getting on top of it and actually what's interesting as well is is in the last 10 years there's been a lot more um partnership working between uh organizations beekeeping associations and the bee unit with with sharing member data in order to try to get on top of these diseases and and i think that's helped too next question giles giles are the shook swarms done at a single hive or whole apiary level this is another good question okay so we did two experiments we did one where we shook swarm on single hives and then we did one where we looked at the whole apiary uh, versus single colony um, and we didn't get enough data back we we had a really really bad year for beekeeping and nobody really wanted to shake okay so because the, the weather wasn't suitable for it so we didn't get enough data for that so subsequently what 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 we've done is we've looked at the data just from bee base in general and it does seem that if you have a whole apiary shook swarm it does look pretty good but we we can't compare that to, to single colony shook swarm unfortunately um, are import, imports an issue? Are imports an issue like chronic bee paralysis virus? Okay, uh, yes they are, um, um, particularly when people bring in whole colonies uh, from abroad. We have had cases over the years where we can, we, so the, the bee inspectors spend some of their time going out to look at imports and assessing the health of imports. Um, <laughs> great, we've got the next one's good. Um, and uh, so, so yes, they can be an issue. And as a result of we knowing them that they can be an issue, then the bee, the bee service did go out and check more of those than they would uh, otherwise check. Um, to clarify this issue with imports and chronic bee paralysis virus, the imports, um, so epidemiology is a funny thing. Um, you start out when you know nothing about an emerging disease, you start out just looking for uh, data which might, correlate to increases in um in prevalence and and one of the things that that, that that correlated was being a professional beekeeper okay that doesn't mean that professional beekeepers are bad beekeepers or that they're all all filthy um it just means that that's one of the um one of the risk factors associated with the disease and it's the same with the imports and people that import it it's just a marker for risk we don't know why it is. It might be that the people that import and the professional beekeepers keep their bees to be so big and healthy that they're pre-exposing pre them to a disease which, is, which people which keep smaller bee colonies don't have. So we don't know why there's that link with chronic bee paralysis virus and imports. That's kind of another talk really. Um, but uh, it's certainly not because we think the imports are carrying the virus, okay? It's not that simple. So I guess, um, if nobody else has any questions, it's been nice to see you all, even though you're all postage stamps, um, and to, to, to talk to you. Um, I'm going to just unmute Ian. Do you want to finish off, Ian? Uh, hello. Thank you very, very much, Charles. Um, I really, really appreciate your time this evening. Um, I think the concern in this area that you've kind of alluded to is that we don't know much about AFB and EFB because it's not around much in this area. The joke used to be a few years ago, one of the former bee inspectors is, oh, you're the one who's never seen fowl brood because they haven't. So for us, 
it, it's it's kind of not something and there is a danger that we become complacent and there is a danger that we don't recognize and we don't follow up because we don't need to but one day we might and so to have a session like this to raise awareness is, is really appreciated and i can't thank you enough